Good afternoon, Gen Chem class. We are back to section 21.5, where we are going to be discussing some pretty interesting compounds. Um, hopefully, you will be able to now recognize a lot of these type of compounds in everyday materials, everyday food items, things like that. So let's get into it. Today, we're just going to be focusing on the first part of 21.5, aldehydes and ketones. Next lecture, we'll focus on the last three, carboxylic acids, esters, and amides. So let's start with aldehydes and ketones. The general structures, very importantly, we have this new functional group that we're going to be discussing is the carbonyl. So when we have a carbon double bonded to an oxygen, we call this a carbonyl group. It's a special group. Um, this center here is generally somewhat reactive. It's got this partial positive character to it. There's a lot of electron density being drawn towards that direction. So we've got this dipole going on with the partial negative side up there. So carbonyl reactive center and aldehyde and ketone. Aldehyde has one R group, so one alkyl chain, so one carbon group of some kind. You know, this could be anything. This could be a long row of these, or it could be a benzene ring attached to another benzene ring. Who knows? But if it's an R group and then you have a carbonyl and you have just an H, then you have an aldehyde. If that carbonyl is tucked between two R groups, we call that a ketone. So where do we see these compounds? Well, we see them all over the place. And two that I just thought of in my head, first of all, benzaldehyde, I see this a lot, uh, in synthetic chemistry and also just a good example of an aldehyde. These both happen to have a benzene functional group attached to them. Notice in the name, benzaldehyde, basically aldehyde, benzene, they call this benzaldehyde. And this you'll find in a lot of different, a lot of different natural occurring compounds, but the one that really stands out is almonds. So if you go and buy pure almond extract from the store, if you have an extract from almonds, a lot of it is benzaldehyde. You can also find imitation extract where it's just 100% this, benzaldehyde. And yet it sounds very chemically, ooh, I'm putting benzaldehyde in my cookies. Well, that's just the name. These are organic compounds. Many of them we don't want to consume, and then just as many we do consume all the time. So chemicals are not necessarily bad. It just depends on how much you have of them and what type you're consuming. The other one I'm pointing out is cinnamaldehyde. It has this double bond in between here and then an aldehyde group at the end, very similar to benzaldehyde and similar kind of floral flavor, but really this, this really hits you like cinnamon, less sweet than benzaldehyde. Where else do we find aldehydes? The welts, we could talk on and on and on, but I was just looking up ideas to try to find some of these functional group examples, and I went back to my favorite website, compoundchem.com, where he goes into talking about the aroma of books. So older books, where are these kind of that classic smell coming from? A lot of it comes from the materials that were used to bind these together. So different types of adhesives, for example, where some it's the actual coating on the paper itself. So notice within these old books, we find our friend benzaldehyde here. And also for furl, this is also very almond-like. Instead of a benzene ring, it has a furin ring attached to it, a five member ring with an oxygen. Uh, vanillin as well. This is a compound you might find. So cellulose itself, the cellulose in the paper products can also break down into some of these types of products. So the cellulose, things binding it, they all kind of give it that odor. Brand new books, on the other hand, have more, um, more of these, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, new, I suppose, new polymers that we use. Um, so you'll find these more modern, there's the word, modern polymers, modern technology that went into making these. Also hydrogen peroxide to bleach the paper white. That can also help break down other materials. So you just get a lot of different type of compounds depending on the bookmaking process. But we call them volatile, VOCs, volatile organic compounds, because they're able to go up into the air from the table. And we need those gas gas phase molecules to come into the, the, the protein sensors in our noses, and we actually detect those. So that's kind of interesting. We see a lot of aldehydes 
And is there any ketones in this example? We do not have a ketone here. I thought we might, but this is an aldehyde group. That's an aldehyde group. They're not showing the H because this is the skeletal structures. This is close. This is an interesting four member ring. But yeah, I thought that was interesting. So one more example is same website, the chemistry of raspberries. So this is an interesting molecule because it has an alcohol group on this end and then it has a ketone over here. So there, here we do find a ketone functional group. You see just a stick like this, that is always just CH3. It has to be drawn like this and just ended to be an H, then you assume that there's an H here. But many times you'll just see ketones drawn with the H versus Sometimes you do see them just drawn like that, where this is supposed to be there, but again, it's the simplest form of the structure that can be drawn. So raspberry ketone, notice the name. Four, so at the four position, so this is, notice the naming system here. How do we number this? Well, this carbonyl takes precedent. So one, oops. Uh, let's see here, one, two, three, four, so that's a butte. That means this is a butte something. It's a butone, but or sorry, butanone for ketone. Two indicates that it's at the two position. That's where the carbonyl is. So if it's one, two, three, four butanone, then this entire thing is part of the substituent. And we call this a four hydroxyphenyl. So now if you're gonna number the phenyl ring, one, two, three, four. It's at the four position on the phenyl ring, and this is our hydroxy phenyl ring. You will not have to name something like this in class. This is much more complicated than what we're focusing on for our class naming. But I thought I'd still point that out to kind of show how they came up with that name for the raspberry ketone. And it is, it's the primary, oops, primary ketone that's responsible for the aroma of raspberries. So a lot of that crammed in there. All right, moving on. So that was just me showing you some structures, understanding what ketones and aldehydes look like. So how do we name these? Not too bad. We use the AL from aldehydes and the ON of ketone to name these. So when we're actually numbering them, like I, I, I pointed out before, the C double bond O in the numbering is given the lowest number possible. So for aldehydes, Let's say I have this aldehyde here. Well, it's always at the one position. So you never actually have to say that for aldehydes. So for aldehydes, the functional group is always located at C1 and need not be indicated. But for a ketone, if you've got a ketone that's like this, is this at the one, two, three, four position? or the one, two, three, four, five, six position. We will minimize the numbers so it'll be at the four position and not with this counting system. This mentions some common examples, formaldehyde and propanone, which we see named as methanol and acetone. I'll show you these in a second here. Actually, I'm just gonna move over to this. So common aldehydes and acetones, oh, sorry, aldehydes and ketones like these, they're almost always referred to as their common names. This is acetone on the left. Or sorry, formaldehyde. I, wrote, I typed that down there. It's the simplest of the aldehydes. And then propanone or acetone is the simplest of the ketones. So this is the smallest possibility you can have for a ketone and our group that's a methyl and a methyl and this is the simplest of the aldehydes where both actually happen to be H's. This is the only aldehyde where you have H's on both sides otherwise you'll step one up to H and then H3C, CH3 over there. So this though would be meth anal. This would be eth ethanol. 
for aldehyde. Propanone over here, or acetone, as you'll always see it be called. This one over here, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six. So we have a hex. We're going to call this hexanone and then tell you where the carbonyl is, and that's at the two position, not the one, two, three, four, five position. So there's a couple examples of those. Um, I wanted to just, I added some more information here about our friend propanone or acetone. Remember, we see this in lab all the time. We have this bottle in lab of acetone next to things like, sometimes we have bottles of, that's propanol back there, methanol. Sometimes we have bottles of ethanol. We use these for cleaning and also for reactions. They're very good solvents. So acetone specifically, it's it's miscible or completely dissolves 100% in any, any ratio with water. It also dissolves many plastics. So you have to kind of be careful with it if you're trying to clean your safety glasses in lab. That's a bad idea to use acetone because it may not be compatible with that plastic and you might melt. I've seen this happen to many in undergrad and it's uh, pretty funny and sad at the same time when they wash their glasses with acetone. Um, you'll see this as an, a nail polish remover, either one component or 100% acetone you can buy from the store to use. Uh, it dissolves those acrylic kind of really, really, you know, tough cured nail polishes and also dissolves many organic compounds in general. So it's used as a rinsing agent for glassware before you final wash it with soap and water. And it's also just used for solvent organic reactions and also just as a, a building block for chemicals. So it's very widespread, millions and tons of it are produced every year. And we typically have a bottle in the lab for cleaning purposes, things like that. So here are a few examples. I'll pause, you, you should pause the video here and see to naming these on your own. And remember if there's substituents like these, substituents need to be named in the correct spots as well. So give that a try and I'll be right back. All right. Let's see what we have here for the first one. So we have an aldehyde. We have a carbonyl next to an R group, and this is our H. So this is definitely an aldehyde. So there's no need to number where this is, but I need to count how many we have here. And there's no substituents coming off of these or anything like that. So this is one, two, three, four. Four, remember, is butte. So we've got a butte. Butanel, call this butanel. And again, there's no need to number this. It's not one butanel because it's always gonna be at the one position regardless for these aldehydes. Next one here, we've got one, two, three, four, five. So five, we're gonna be a pent something. Pent, we have an R group and an R group. This is a ketone. So penta known, N-O-N-E, pentanone. And then we count one, two. So this is two pentanone. And then the last one, what do we have here? Oh, I just need it. So we, we have another aldehyde. We need to count what's the longest chain. One, two, three, one, two, three. So those are all equivalent. So let's count this one, two, three. So three means it is a prop, prop anal of some kind. But now we need to tell you where the substituents are on that ring or on that, that chain. And they're at the two position. So we have two, two, dimeth. So we need to remember to write our two, comma, dash, or sorry, two, no comma, no dash. 2-2. Two, two. I ran out of room. Dimethyl. It's probably better to write that way till the end, but I like to write this out first so I make sure I get that last part correct. So 2-2 two, two, dimethyl prop uh, now for that one. And Butanol, 2-pentanone, and 2,2-dimethylpropanol. Okay, so that really is it. This is a short lecture. We're going to be spending the larger amount of time focused on these derivatives. So go back and make sure you're doing a lot of these kind of going from names to structures and also from structures back to names. And hopefully you enjoyed learning about some of the 
naturally occurring aldehydes and ketones that we find everywhere. Uh, and we're going to learn more about those in the next section. I'll see you guys then.